All right, Secretary Azar, thank you very much uh, on behalf of the LAN and all of us here for your leadership on these very important issues related to advancing value-based care. And to all of you, uh, good morning from me. It's great to see so many of you here. For those of you who are standing in the back of the room, we've actually expanded. We have kind of an overflow area here. It's still pretty good views. Um, you can either walk up the middle or go around the outside, but uh, no need to be standing at the back. There are plenty of, uh, of seats over here to the side. Um, you just heard some significant recent and new steps on payment reform and support for the additional changes in the healthcare system that payment reform needs to succeed system wide. New steps at CMMI, new CMS initiatives, also new uh, HHS wide policies around data sharing and interoperability around uh, new uh, announcements related to the uh, Stark and anti-kickback rules, the most substantial updates in a very long time, relate, also related rules about how providers and organizations can share data to work together, new steps on transparency intended to help everyone, providers and patients, learn more about how they can get the best care at the lowest cost. So new further goals uh, on the part of HHS uh, and CMS. And I want to thank Seema Verma, Administrator Verma, uh, and the CMS team that's here today, and Seema, my team. You'll be hearing from a lot of them later in more detail about some of these new initiatives. And it's also time for some new steps at the Learning and Action Network. The LAN has been around for three and a half years or so now through two administration reflecting the bipartisan principle that reform in our healthcare system requires the private and public sectors, federal and state and commercial and nonprofit to work together to enable system-wide progress. And you just heard a resoundingly strong commitment for taking further steps to enable that collaboration at the federal level and today you're going to hear more about those kinds of commitments for further steps across all of these other sectors. So the LAN is intended to be a key part of supporting those system-wide efforts, reflecting this continuing emphasis on public and private collaboration, which is just getting more urgent with the persistent gaps in quality of care and lack of affordability in our current healthcare system for so many Americans. Now, before I turn to the specific updates, I want to do something important first, and that's to thank Mark Smith for his tremendous service to the land uh, over the past four years. His guidance has steered uh, all of our work. Mark uh, is going to stay involved in all of this. He's been a terrific and dedicated leader at the land and in healthcare reform generally, especially for people who need help the most. Mark, thank you for all of your service in these efforts. <laughs> And I'd also like to take a moment to uh, recognize Mark Harrison, the other other Mark, uh, I guess. Uh, Mark is the CEO of Intermountain Healthcare, and he's the new co-chair of the Land CEO Forum. So more on the CEO Forum in a minute. Uh, Mark couldn't be here with us today, but he wanted to send his regards. I know he knows many of you, and you all have seen his commitment uh, at Cleveland Clinic, now at, uh, uh, now at Intermountain, to, to drive the kinds of reforms we're focusing on today. We're very pleased to have such an accomplished leader on board to help drive change at the CEO level in the private sector uh, as we move into this next phase of the land's work. So to set the stage for those next steps, I'm going to announce first the, the LAN's 2019 measure and effort results, building on the ones that Mark described uh, a little while ago, and also introduce you to the LAN's new goals and the LAN's new steps to help get to those bold goals. Uh, first, uh, the, the LAN measurement effort. I, can think, I think you can see on the slide, um, the LAN has been at this for a few years, as Mark mentioned, focusing on how many dollars and uh, what types of dollars are flowing through alternative payment models, models with some component of payment tied to spending and results at the episode or person level. Uh, the LAN APM framework, which Mark reviewed, included uh, category 3A, that's upside risk or shared savings, and then also models with so-called downside risk, 
categories 3B and 4 in the LAN framework. And last year we started reporting payments, uh, payment data by line of business. That was 2017, 2017 data reported in 2018. Line of businesses are commercial, Medicaid, Medicare Advantage, traditional Medicare. This year's measurement effort continues that. It includes traditional Medicare data in addition to data from 62 health plans, seven fee-for-service Medicaid states that don't rely on Medicaid managed care, representing a total of 77% of covered people in the United States. That's about 226 million people for reference. Back in 2015, when the LAN first launched, the goal of linking 50% of healthcare payments in the US to quality and value through alternative payment models was intended to be reached by 2018. And the LAN has done this surveying to help track progress and also learn what's working and what's not to help advance different kinds of payment reform. But again, the goal isn't payment reform in itself, it's to get to better care uh, and, and lower costs for people. The first measurement effort reported back in 2015 that 23% 23% of all healthcare payments were tied to these so-called alternative payment models. That number increased to 29% in 2016, to 34% in 2017, and today, for the 2018 results, we're showing another step up to 36% of payments through alternative payment models, shared savings, shared risk, bundled payments, population-based payments, direct contracting payments, like the secretary uh, described. Now, um, looking a little bit deeper into these results, about 39% of uh, payments flowed through category one uh, and uh, um, uh, through fee-for-service models with no link to quality and value. 25% uh, of payments flow flowed through category two fee-for-service models with a, a link and an incentive bonus or penalty uh, related to quality or value. 31% through, flowed through qua, uh, category three models, that's the 21 plus the, the nine on the, on the slide. And uh, uh, that includes both upside and downside uh, alternate payment models built on fee-for-service architecture. And 5% flowed through population-based payment uh, eight alternative payment models. That's closer to the full direct contracting uh, with payments mainly about people, mainly about the whole set of services, uh, not about a link to uh, fee-for-service and, and those administrative details. Look a little bit closer at this and you can see that 15% of payments flowed through a combination of categories 3B, that's the fee-for-service base, but with significant downside risk, a significant component that is more about the person and more about the episode, not just based on fee-for-service. Uh, and then um, in category 4A, 4B, and 4C as well, add all those together, that's 15% uh, of payments in the survey. And what I wanna emphasize is that all of the increase that we saw in the use of alternative payment models occurred in these advanced payment reform categories. They were all accounted for. That, that full increase uh, to 36% from 34 was accounted for by, and more, uh, was accounted for by downside risk. 15% up from about 12% in 2017. So there is already a shift taking place in the way that we are moving to alternative payment models. Since we started measuring the types of healthcare payments, the percentage of payments in straight fee for service with no link to quality and value has dropped substantially from 62% in 2015 to 40% in 2018, more than a one third reduction. Uh, category two fee-for-service payments. Uh, think of fee-for-service payments with a, a little bit of a bonus or penalty for a specific quality measure, a specific thing that a provider might do, an incentive payment. Uh, those have increased by roughly 60% while categories three and four together have also increased by almost 60%. And again, we've only been tracking three B and four recently, but those rates, which started out very low, are growing more rapidly. So what's happening in this shift? Well, one thing we're seeing 
already in 2018 is more emphasis on moving to the 3B and 4 models rather than simply prioritizing the shift to any alternative payment model. Uh, for example, our group at the Duke Margolis Center at Duke reported earlier this week in a health affairs blog that the share of traditional Medicare beneficiaries in ACOs actually went down in the past year, but the share in category 3B and 4 model ACOs went up significantly, reflecting the changes to the Medicare Shared Savings Program that Secretary Azar just reviewed. We're also seeing a shift towards 3B and 4 models in other payments, including Medicare Advantage and commercial plans. This shift reflects the view that more than incremental changes away from fee-for-service are needed to really support significant reforms in care. I want to emphasize that this emerging shift is not about clinicians, hospitals, and other providers needing to be incentivized through downside risk. It's about having payments that support sustainable care models that include what patients really need not payments that support only slight or early uh, steps away from fee-for-service. In Category 2 models and in Category 3A models, probably 99% of the underlying payments are still tied to fee-for-service. Those models have been shown to produce some improvements in care and to pay for some new capabilities, needed capabilities, to help organizations get going on more patient-centered models of care but they haven't really changed the fee-for-service chassis of American healthcare. On the other hand, there is some promising evidence emerging, and Secretary Azar mentioned some of it, that organizations that stick with it and move farther away from fee-for-service are better able to do the things that both significantly improve outcomes and lower the total cost of care. These reforms can also reduce administrative burdens and frustrations that providers face today, as Secretary Azar mentioned, by reducing the fee-for-service burdens, by reducing the need for utilization review and micro-regulation like through Stark and anti-kickback, and by providing more flexibility for new partnerships to improve care. So this year's measurement effort also surveyed, besides these results, it also surveyed payers on the future of alternative payment model adoption. 91% of those payers across the U.S. healthcare systems believe that APM activities will continue to increase and that increased APM adoption is very important for both improving outcomes and lowering costs. So there is a very broad-based expectation that the shift I just described will continue, but also an increasing realization that just adopting some quality incentives and shared savings alone, at least for the longer term, won't be enough. So the land survey shows that the progress that we've seen as of 2018 fell short of the land's original goal of 50% of payments in alternative payment models. and it's also shown that the payments that only shift incrementally from fee-for-service to date have had only incremental impacts on health care costs and on uh, many aspects of health care reforms. But the land survey, the experience compiled through the land's activities that Mark reviewed, show that more significant impacts are possible. Achieving those greater impacts takes more work. There are unquestionably important barriers to adopting substantial shifts away from fee-for-service. These include providers' understandable reluctance to take on big shifts and new kinds of financial risk, their readiness and capabilities and ability to invest or to get support for investments, the supports they need from payers and from other pricing and regulatory policies to go along with the overall shift. The land and all of us here have learned a lot uh, over the past three and a half years about what works and what doesn't to get there and about the need for these kinds of collective systematic changes from everyone across the payment landscape. There's a lot more to do to make progress and more to learn, but the urgent demand for higher quality care at a lower cost continues to drive payment reform and in particular this trend towards bigger shifts away from fee-for-service, not for the sake of risk, but because all those who contribute to higher quality care at the lowest cost need better financial support 
to get there, to create those sustainable business models. Patients, providers, payers, purchasers, policymakers, product manufacturers need payments that enable the better care models. So as you heard from the secretary, the public and private leaders representing all these groups who are guiding the land's efforts are announcing some new goals today. Not because we're below 50% on the original APM goals, but to focus on payment reforms that end up moving more than incrementally away from fee for service. These goals align with the current state and the recent trends in payment reform, as well as the evolving goals and objectives for CMMI, for CMS, and for HHS, as you just heard from Secretary Azar. And this is not just true inside the government. Uh, as Patrick Conway said, he formerly led uh, CMMI and now is in the private sector. Shared savings was an important early step, but if we really want to improve care, we need to help healthcare providers and all their partners move further from fee for service. So uh, we have a new uh, goals uh, statement going along with uh, the, the new uh, and improved LAN homepage and, and available resources. Um, and I want to say something about uh, the, these new goals now. They're bold, they're aspirational like the original land goals, but they are updated based on the experiences of the last few years as well as based on what is actually going on in the public and private sector actions around uh, health care reform and payment reform in particular. The LAN aims to accelerate the percentage of U.S. healthcare payment tied to quality and value in each market segment through the adoption of shared accountability. APMs that include more than a nominal shift from fee for service, more than shared savings. That doesn't mean you can't start out in shared savings, but it isn't the end goal. These are categories 3B, 4A, 4B, and 4C from the LANS APM framework. And in particular, we're aiming to tie 30% of Medicare Advantage payments, that's that third column in light blue, to shared accountability APMs by 2020, 50% by 2022, and 100% by 2025. Uh, today we are not there yet, but we are already at almost 25% uh, in Medicare Advantage payments through these significant shifts away from fee-for-service. And we're aiming to tie 30% of traditional Medicare payments, that last column, uh, to shared accountability by 2020, 50% by 2022, 100% by 2025. Today, we're at about 18%, 18.2%. So significantly less, but you just heard a whole set of announcements about initiatives that are going to be available right away starting next year to help boost those numbers uh, in the near term. And uh, going to the dark blue column, commercial, uh, the aim is for 15% of payments uh, in shared accountability alternative payment models by 2020, 25% 25 by, uh, 25 by 2022, 50% by 2025. Today, we're at about 11%, so a ways to go there. And we have a lot of attention today uh, around uh, shifts and opportunities in the commercial sector. And finally, aiming for 15% of Medicaid payments in shared accountability by 2020, 25% by 22, 50% by 2025, you see the pattern. Uh, we're at under 10% today, around 8.3%. Uh, so this may be a bigger challenge, but I've seen uh, a strong commitment around, among uh, Medicaid and, and state leaders uh, to adopt these steps. You'll hear about, hear about more uh, of this in a keynote later this afternoon um, right here at the LAN. So this is not to say that shared savings models and category two fee-for-service incentives are unimportant. They can make a difference. They're an important step, maybe even for several years as organizations get going. But in effect, these new goals are saying that we no longer think that those incremental steps from fee-for-service should be the end point and that it is an urgent priority for us to find better ways to support faster progress and more success together. These goals will require commitment, action from everyone in this room and beyond, uh, everyone who's involved in the healthcare reform enterprise. They're bold goals because the land's guiding leaders have a bold vision for the future of care, supported by payment reform and some important new steps in the land itself. 
So the, the, the LANS uh, um, uh, website uh, uh, reflects these goals. The LANS vision is simple, an American healthcare system that pays for value to sustain better care uh, models for patients and communities. Uh, that's why shared accountability is so important and so much of a focus of the summit today and the future of payment reform. To support these steps, the LAN itself is taking on some new responsibilities. The LAN strength comes from its public-private partnerships. You all who are part of these efforts are doing remarkable things in the commercial space, the state space, the, the, the private nonprofit space to create and adopt this shared accountability payment structure. And you heard about CMMI's new steps on models that change uh, to these uh, levels, uh, greater levels of, of accountability and shifts away from fee-for-service. Uh, this is why we're here today, to enable more effective action and progress, and so I want to spend my last few minutes on uh, how the LAN is aiming to support faster progress on effective payment reform with this renewed support from HHS and the states and all of the stakeholders in this room. We're going to continue to take steps to bring uh, public and private stakeholders together around core uh, de APM design components. We're going to host forums and continue to have uh, shared activities like this one uh, to build consensus and, and share lessons among leaders. We're going to continue to measure the progress of APM adoption. Mark mentioned the roadmap for driving high performance in alternative payment models has already proved to be a pretty popular set of tools. We're going to aim to build on those uh, around supporting effective APM design, payer provider co collaboration, uh, and steps to enable patient centered care to help uh, healthcare stakeholders navigate areas where they may have pain points and to find practical steps forward for uh, both big plans as well as uh, small health plans to enter and succeed in the alternative payment model market. And that includes state uh, Medicaid programs as well. But the land's doing more. Uh, it's now convening two executive forums, a new CEO forum, a CEO level forum, consisting of public and private organizational leaders including Administrator Seema Verma, committed to identifying and supporting further shared strategic initiatives to enable progress in this space. You're going to hear from some of the leaders on this CEO forum in, in just a few moments. Uh, also, a new care transformation forum comprised of executives and clinical leaders with leading experience and the capacity to work together to design and implement these new initiatives to support more progress on payment reform. With the momentum from the CEO forum, with the expert guidance and collaboration reaching out to many of you through work groups and other activities led by the Care Transformation Forum, the LAN intends to execute on key practical activities that together can help advance APM adoption and meet payment reform goals. Uh, so uh, here's the, the structure, so leadership and vision through the CEO forum and then uh, vision and, and execution of steps through that care transformation forum. Continued efforts around measurement, but refined to capture uh, these more advanced alternative payment models. Continued engagement through the summit and other communications and uh, outreach activities. Uh, and then activation, again, led by the Care Transformation Forum and its efforts to work uh, with all of you on specific key topics uh, to address steps that can uh, enable more rapid uh, progress. Um, uh, you're going to hear uh, from, from this group uh, in, in just a moment of uh, some of our uh, 6P leaders uh, that are members of the, the, the CEO Council. Um, and uh, I talked about the, the, the goal statement before. Oops, I thought I had one more slide in there. I'm going to go back to the, the pretty picture of uh, all of our next speakers. But uh, before I wrap this up, I just want to mention a few of the ideas that have been emphasized by our CEO forum, which has already met and is already pushing ahead uh, to uh, support these goals. And you've also seen some of the uh, other organizations that are involved in supporting the new goals already. We hope you'll join the effort. We understand there may be questions along the way in terms of getting there, but, but the activities for this new uh, LAN 
action-oriented effort with CEO level momentum and uh, care transformation forum expertise behind it include, it include steps like increasing practical data transparency and sharing, uh, improve steps like identifying ways to address uh, inappropriate care as well as promoting uh, more appropriate care as organizations move down the road faster uh, in these new payment models. Also, population-specific approaches for complex patients and including risk adjustment and other issues that are very important uh, for success involving vulnerable populations and efforts at the local level to get to a critical mass faster uh, of payment reforms across the public and private sectors. You hear about uh, one of those uh, efforts uh, in North Carolina more this, this afternoon. So for this all to succeed, we need to take more steps together. That starts today. Today at the summit, we hope you'll take advantage of all of the experiences around you and the different perspectives, have a chance to network as well as learn from the session themselves. We'd like you to reflect on the new goals. What do you think about them? What actions do you think would make the biggest difference in getting to these uh, very aspirational goals? Building on your own experiences, the experiences of those around you, and the new reforms that uh, are taking place today. You just heard about some important ones uh, from CMS. Together, while these are bold goals, I think we can accelerate the shift to value-based care and achieving better outcomes at a lower cost and give patients better access to the kind of care that they really want. And we are committed to making the LAN a key vehicle for enabling all of us, CMS, HHS, states, all the private sector, to work together to make that happen. There are going to be more activities from the LAN in the weeks and months ahead, so stay tuned. But right now, I want to thank you all for your support of the LAN and for your consideration of how to make the most of these bold new goals starting today. Thank you very much. Thank you.